In the music industry, it probably feels pretty good to be at the top of your game. Unfortunately, it also means there's only one way to go from there, down. Just ask these musicians, whose careers were destroyed by everything from criminal scandals to wardrobe malfunctions to lip-sync nightmares. In 1958, rock and roll icon Jerry Lee Lewis decided to take his underage wife with him on his tour of England. What happened next isn't much of a surprise. Lewis had neglected to tell anyone he was newly married, so when he rocked up with Myra Gale Lewis in tow, the British press were naturally curious. A Daily Mail reporter, Paul Tanfield, happened to ask how old the newlywed was. Lewis said she was 15 and ended his transatlantic career in one fell swoop. The worst part of all this is that Lewis was lying. Myra was actually 13. Oh, and she was Lewis's cousin, too. Naturally, his British tour collapsed. Those that showed up to his gigs only booed him. Concerts were canceled, his expensive hotel kicked him out, and when he finally hightailed it back to the States, he found he'd been blacklisted from the industry. The radio would no longer play his songs, he was dropped from TV appearances, and demand for his performances all but disappeared though he never lost his recording contract and continued to release a number of mostly unsuccessful singles. DJ and songwriter Alan Freed's name is obscure today, but he left behind one heck of a legacy. He's credited with being the guy who coined the term rock and roll, threw the world's first rock concert, and was instrumental in determining the course of post-war American music. Between 1952 and 1957, he was practically the kingmaker of rock and roll, but what happened in 1957? At the time, Freed had a nationally syndicated ABC show, Big Beat, which broadcast his newfangled rock and roll to the entire country. One evening, however, something so unbelievably and unremittingly anti-American happened that the network had no choice but to immediately pull the plug. Big Beat showed a black performer dancing on stage with a white woman. It might sound ridiculous to 21st century ears, but that one interracial dance was enough to get Freed's show canceled. And it couldn't have come at a worse time for Freed, whose health was collapsing and marriage was falling apart. Two years later, the final blow came. While still on the ropes from his Big Beat controversy, Freed was investigated by the FBI for accepting cash to play records as part of the payola scandal. What was left of his career was over, and he died in 1965 as a penniless alcoholic. The moment that made Ashley Simpson fade away came during her SNL performance in 2004, when she realized her band was playing the same song she had sung earlier in the show. Unfortunately, the vocals had been pre-recorded. Now, Simpson isn't exactly the first artist to lip-sync a performance, but this practice is almost universally despised by fans, and Simpson was not forgiven for her mistake. According to People, she was relentlessly hounded by critics and former fans simply for the fact that she'd actually dared to engage in deception via lip-syncing. And when she tried to explain that a severe case of acid reflux had prompted her decision to fake the performance, everyone just ended up hating her more. Even today, Simpson hasn't shaken off the experience. The two albums that followed her fateful SNL performance undersold the one she'd been promoting at the time, and she hasn't had a top 10 song since. At least Ashley Simpson can take comfort in knowing that she's not the only musician to have derailed her own career on Saturday Night Live. In fact, SNL-related career derailment was pioneered in 1992 by Sinead O'Connor, when she sang Bob Marley's War and ended her performance by ripping up a photograph of the Pope. Generally, you're not going to get a good reaction by attacking the Pope on live television in a country where nearly 25% of the population is Catholic. To be fair, however, she was protesting the abuse of children in the Catholic Church, a problem the general public is much more aware of today than it was in 1992. And back then, most Americans were especially clueless about the issue, because at that point it was mostly being brought to light only in Ireland. Still, O'Connor became so unpopular after that little faux pas that she was booed at Bob Dylan's 30th anniversary concert just two weeks later. Not long after that, she announced her retirement. She didn't stay retired, of course, but she was never able to quite recapture the success she'd once had. I was genuinely very angry with what the church were doing. By ripping that picture, you know, I risked my career, everything. I could be a billionaire now if I wanted, if I believed in that. During the halftime show at Super Bowl 38 in 2004, Justin Timberlake pulled down Janet Jackson's leather bustier and exposed her breasts to a television audience of roughly 100 million people. 
Both artists later said the stunt had only been sort of intentional. Timberlake was supposed to reveal the red lace under Jackson's bustier, but he ended up tearing off the whole thing instead. Inevitably, the American viewing audience Viacom and the FCC proceeded to lose their collective minds. Around 540,000 people complained to the FCC, and the FCC responded by attempting and failing to fine CBS $550,000 for the incident. But the person who suffered most was Jackson. Viacom, which owns MTV, CBS, VH1, and a bunch of radio stations wanted revenge, so they banned her music from all of their properties. And then a bunch of other media companies did the same thing, and pretty soon no one was playing Janet Jackson songs. Just to rub salt in the wound, she was also uninvited from the Grammys. It's worth noting that Timberlake was not uninvited from the Grammys, nor was he banned from MTV or Viacom. The Monkees got a lot of shade for being a so-called manufactured band, but they managed to survive for decades because they never lied about what they were. History doesn't remember the 90s pop group Milli Vanilli quite so kindly, because Milli Vanilli was all lies. Frontmen Rob Palatis and Fab Morvan had basically just lip-synced their way to fame and fortune. And it wasn't Ashley Simpson-style I Have Acid Reflux lip-syncing either. Palatis and Morvan didn't even do their own singing in the studio. Their voices were 100% other singers who had been sworn to utmost secrecy. So how did Pilatus and Morvan end up as the faces of Milli Vanilli when other people were doing all the singing? According to Gizmodo, producer Frank Farian thought the real singers were unmarketable, so he hired a couple of models to pretend that they were the ones singing. What he didn't seem to comprehend was that you can't keep a lie that size quiet forever, especially when it got you a Grammy. In 1989, Milli Vanilli was doing a live performance on MTV when the backing track skipped. The media immediately took interest, did some further digging, and discovered that Pilatus and Morvan actually did none of their own singing for the group. Milli Vanilli lost their Grammy, and that was pretty much the end of that. Michael Jackson's 2005 trial was the media circus of the century. Jackson was accused of molesting Gavin Arvizo, who was 15 years old at the time. He was acquitted, but since then no one has really been able to agree on whether he was actually a child molester or just a seriously weird dude who liked to have sleepovers with kids. Still, there's no doubt he made some incredibly stupid and arrogant decisions. One of them was the fact that he regularly allowed young boys to sleep in his bedroom and pretended like there wasn't anything weird about it. And he even said as much in the 2003 documentary Living with Michael Jackson, which was probably what led to his downfall. Police saw the film, opened an investigation, raided Jackson's Neverland Ranch, and the circus began. In the end, it didn't matter that he was acquitted because most people had already made up their minds. In the years following the trial, Jackson developed a dangerous prescription drug addiction. His dependence on the anesthetic propofol deprived his body of real sleep and gave him severe symptoms of sleep deprivation, which included an inability to remember lyrics or learn new dance moves. His career stagnated and his debts continued to mount. Ultimately, it was propofol that killed him in 2009. Even now, the eye-opening new documentary Leaving Neverland seems on track to kill the last of Jackson's positive legacy. I was really into jewelry, and he would reward me with jewelry for doing sexual acts for him. Fame does weird things to people, and no one knows that better than George Michael, who was a renowned singer and heartthrob during the 80s. In 1998, Michael was arrested for engaging in a lewd act in a public restroom. You've got to admire his attitude, though, because after all that went down, he didn't just crawl into a hole and hide, he actually considered it his moment. The once reclusive Michael was suddenly agreeing to interviews, and by the end of the scandal, he'd gone from a closeted pop star to an out and proud gay pop star. Prior to this incident, Michael had only come out to friends and family, although he had often alluded to it in the lyrics of his songs. Michael's career never really recovered, though, at least not in America, where homophobia is still rampant. But to many, Michael is today remembered for publicly embracing his sexuality and helping young gay people feel like they could do the same. In 1990, police seized weapons, pornographic videotapes, marijuana and hashish, and $130,000 in cash from Chuck Berry's home. Not long after that, a bunch of women filed a class-action lawsuit against him, alleging that he had video cameras hidden in the bathrooms of his house and a restaurant he owned. Cameras that he would use to record women, some of whom were underaged while they were dressing, undressing, or using the bathroom. 
In the end, Barry got off pretty lightly. He was charged with drug possession and child abuse, but the child abuse charges were dropped and he was sentenced to just two years of unsupervised probation, plus $5,000 paid to a drug rehabilitation program. That seems like nothing, but the incident also cost Barry $1.2 million in legal fees. Although his career wasn't ruined in the sense that he was blacklisted or forced into destitution, pretty much no one could see him lie without feeling seriously icky about it. In 2014, CeeLo Green proved that a good career can easily end over a heinous act of violence. Green's career-defining moment was the one in which he took to Twitter to dubiously proclaim his innocence after he was accused of indecently assaulting an unconscious woman. And then he also tweeted some nonsensical stuff about how you can't be with someone if you're unconscious, which just served to make him look even more guilty than he had before. Somehow, Green managed to squirm his way out of the allegations and was convicted only on a lesser charge of supplying drugs, because fame is powerful. He got three years probation and community service, but his career never really recovered. And the most notable thing he's done since was a performance during the opening ceremonies at the 2017 World Aquatics Championship in Budapest, as well as some voice work on the children's animated series Teen Titans Go! Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.